Hey, hey, this is Cedric, your host of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. I hope everyone had a fun and safe Halloween yesterday. Before we get into this truly fascinating conversation with Michael Saylor about his speech at the Atlas Shrug Society, which described how Satoshi opened a portal from the physical realm into the digital realm, bringing life to a formerly dead realm consisting of only shadows and ghosts, bringing conservation of energy and matter, objectivity, truth, time, and consequence into the digital realm. So before we unpack all of that, I want to tell you about CrowdHealth. Last week, I interviewed Andy Schoonover, the CEO of CrowdHealth, and I came away from that conversation more compelled than ever that by taking responsibility for your own health with your own money on a Bitcoin standard is the solution to the broken healthcare system that until now we have been trapped inside of. So please go back and check out that conversation with Andy and think about what if you didn't have to pay healthcare premiums anymore? What if you could invest in Bitcoin instead? Stop supporting the broken health insurance system with your hard-earned money. Right now, you can get your first six months for just $99 per month. That's just a fraction of high deductible insurance plans. So go to joincrowdhealth.com and use code matrix now and experience freedom from health insurance by utilizing Bitcoin. Crowd health is not health insurance. It's a totally different way of paying for health care. Terms and conditions may apply. And now let's enter the Bitcoin matrix with Michael Saylor for this amazing rip on how Bitcoin is a union that offers hope for the individual struggling against the oppressive force of the collective and how it is the best chance we have to heal our world and rise above the chaos. What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Michael Saylor is an American entrepreneur and business executive. He is the executive chairman and a co-founder of MicroStrategy, a company that provides business intelligence, mobile software, and cloud-based services. Saylor served as MicroStrategy's chief executive officer from 1989 to 2022. He authored the 2012 book, The Mobile Wave, How Mobile Intelligence Will Change Everything. He is also the sole trustee of Saylor Academy, a provider of free online education. As of 2016, Saylor has been granted 31 patents and has nine additional applications under review. Michael Saylor is also a former rocket scientist having studied aeronautics and astronautics at MIT on an Air Force scholarship before founding MicroStrategy in 1989. Michael Saylor, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you? I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Uh, I'm excited to get to speak with you. Uh, I've really enjoyed what you've been putting out since you ca- since you came onto the scene about two years ago, a little over two years ago. But I have to admit, I was kind of blown away by your speech at the Atlas Society. I think in 10 years, it'll be seen as a remarkably visionary uh, speech and, and the ideas that were put down there. So I would love to kind of get into that right away and unpack some of those ideas. Uh, primarily, maybe we could start with the individual, you know, the individual struggle versus the collective. And what is the challenge of authority that we're dealing with today? Okay. Well, you know, the the genesis of the speech is um, I was invited uh, to speak at the Atlas Society Gala. And uh, of course, the Atlas Society is is you know, based loosely or, or inspired by Atlas Shrugged and the idea of Ayn Rand. Of Ayn Rand. And uh, Atlas Shrugged, the book, is kind of her iconic work. And the whole theme of the book is is that uh, the um, the forces of the state and collectivism are encroaching upon individual individualist and creativity and and uh, the individual is being sacrificed at the altar of the state, uh, you know, and in order to support, you know, perhaps socialist ideals or authoritarian ideals, right? N- no one can uh, can go too fast. No one can 
can um, can do too much. So the book was pretty incredible because written in 1957. And uh, I read it for the first time in the uh, early 80s. And when I read it, you know, you read it and you say, this is Ayn Rand giving us a warning about what will happen in our country if we go the way of the Soviet Union. You know, you, you read it as a warning. Don't uh, don't go to a communist state or a socialist mm. state. You know, and if you're if you're an up and coming American citizen, right, who believes in the system, then uh, then you think that's that's something I have to worry about if I lived somewhere mm. else, but not here. Right. I think uh, Chris has made that point on your podcast. <laughs> yeah. uh, they're lost when I listened to it. You know, if you trust the system, you know, not a big deal. If you don't trust the system, it's different. So the book is all about the struggle of the individual and ultimately, ultimately all the, the individuals that are, that are inventing things. Right. And, and the, the primary things they're inventing are reared in metal, which is like, it, Reared in metal is to steel what steel is to iron or bronze, right? It's it's the next thing that makes the civilization possible. Mm. Without steel, right, we we wouldn't have created the 20th century civilization. And so reared in metal is the 21st century upgrade to steel. It's harder, faster, stronger, better, indestructible, light, right? You could almost say... You know, a metaphor is aluminum, right? Aluminum yeah. was not quite as good as reared in metal, but but without aluminum, there'd be no airplane. You literally can't create an airplane with steel. And so you take away aluminum. If someone says, oh, aluminum, it's the enemy of the people, you know, we shouldn't have aluminum. Okay, well, there's no airlines. There's no air, air travel, right? And <laughs> Andrew Mellon got rich off of aluminum, right? That's, the, that's one of the companies that he launched, Aluminum Company of America. So- so the book is about entrepreneurs uh, attempting to make the world a better place, and they keep getting stymied by the forces of regulation, at, you know, e either non-competitive monopolies that are supported by, by uh, the government or, or government agencies. And they, uh, they eventually get frustrated, so frustrated that they decide just to withdraw from the society and from the economy. They go on strike. And the phrase Atlas Shrugged refers to what would happen if if uh, the guy that's holding up the world on his shoulders decided to shrug, if he just decided he wasn't going to do it anymore. So John Galt leads the, you know, leads this, uh, you know, kind of revolution. And John Galt is this uh, this shadowy figure that nobody knows about, right? The entire theme of the book is, or or the the, the meme of the book is, who is got John Galt? Who is John Galt, right? If if uh, if you're struggling against uh, the overwhelming collective and mediocrity, and you don't feel like you can't create anything, and you and you and you're not allowed to own the fruits of your labor, and the world is uh, is going barreling off of a cliff, then you you know you say, who is John Galt? Well, she wrote that in 1957, and of course, uh, you know who is Satoshi Nakamoto, right? <laughs> pops up in the Bitcoin world, right? So Satoshi Nakamoto is the, is the person that looked at the system and said, uh, you know, the system is is corrupt or it's dysfunctional. If, if we wanted to make it narrow, we would say Satoshi Nakamoto looks at currencies and banking and says the system is dysfunctional. If you wanted to be a bit more provocative, you say it's just corrupt. And John Galt looked at the system and said it's dysfunctional, and Ayn Rand would have said it's corrupt. And so John Galt's solution is goes off to everybody quits their job, they stop creating things, right? The heroes basically sabotage their own companies, like Frances Francisco Dan Kanye sabotages his own company, and uh, and goes off to Galt's Gulch. And eventually, uh, the rest of the of the creators do the same thing, and that's their protest. The idea being, if we just all withdraw from the economy, then maybe somebody will notice, and we can create a better world. So uh, when I went into the speech, you know, my view was, well, I have a chance to speak to objectivists, and they've all read the book, and they all uh, must agree with the ideas of Ayn Rand. 
I did a quick check. I think uh, the book sold 9 million copies. So and it's a long book. It takes uh, it takes 60 hours to listen to it on an audio book. So call it, it's a one week long read. So it's, it's not the most efficient way uh, to deliver the ideology. <laughs> and maybe it was the, the right way in 1957, right? right? Makes sense. But I wanted to, uh, I wanted to reach uh, this entire group and I wanted to explain to them after, I mean, how many years is it now? After 65 years of, uh, of uh, understanding the problem and then commiserating with each other, maybe it would be more constructive to do something about it because the only suggestion that uh, Atlas Shrug offers is you can just go on strike and withdraw from the society, whereas Satoshi offered a much better suggestion, a much more constructive suggestion. Instead of trying to change the world that you disagree with, trying to right the dysfunction, trying to cure the corruption, all of which is an impossible task. And, and, it's, it, and it's clear it's impossible based upon the Hayek quote that I use mm -hmm. in the speech, right? You can't simply change the entire world for the better, you know, by addressing all 100 vectors of dysfunction. You're going to have to find some sly roundabout means to introduce constructive, cheerful change, right? You have to launch a viral ideology into the system, which, uh, which is viewed as progressive. So... You know, I, I crafted the speech with the thought that I wanted to show uh, the similarities between uh, between oct oct objectivism and the Bitcoin movement. I wanted to point out all the shared antecedents, right? The Austrian economics school of thought, libertarian schools of thought, conservative uh, conservative uh, political ideologies, conservative economic ideologies, engineering and science uh, and, uh, and technology ideologies, right? They're all kind of shared themes. And uh, my key point is there's no point being a martyr. You want to be a winner. And, uh, and ultimately, I, my, f my frustration with the entire objectivist movement, and I suppose my frustration uh, with all uh, intellectual movements, and there's plenty of them, right? The world's full of a bunch of intellectuals, all of these intellectual movements. They typically write very, very long books. First, I write a thousand page book, then another thousand page book, then another thousand page book. Then they have lots of meetings and then they commiserate with each other. And then they attempt, uh, then they attempt to outdo each other in explaining just how bad the world is and how much better it would be if it wasn't the way it is. And, uh, you know, that is, uh, it, it's an academic exercise arguing over, you know, sophistry, sophistries and, uh, and nuances. But what does it matter, right? What does it matter? At the end of the day, why is it that the libertarians, the Austrian ec economists, the objectivists, the conservatives, and the, and the engineers aren't all agreeing on something? Because they're all, they're all kind of huddle in their corners, and they're, you know, I think the objectivist movement splintered into four different movements. Like there's probably three or four groups that will argue over what she meant when she wrote this in the book, but it doesn't really matter what she meant when she wrote this in the book. The question is, what are you going to do for the eight billion people? And you can you can tell, you know, you see this exercise on Twitter, right? Sometimes you'll get in a debate with an intellectual on Twitter. And they want to debate, you know, the definition of the of the term in a book from 70 years ago and whether or not they're right about it or not. Uh, and these are all, you know, ridiculous academic debates because, no, it, it's pretty easy to criticize everything. And it's and so the world is full of a lot of people criticizing everything, showing how smart they are by decomposing either. I'm going to tell you how bad the world is in 99 chapters. Or I'm going to tell you, you know, how bad your idea is in 37 different points, but no one's offering a solution. And so, in the absence of a solution, you're just generating noise. Mm. So, 
that that speech is me saying, look, you, you know, she saw the problem 60 years ago. You need to separate the state from the economy. Satoshi saw the problem, right? When you say separate the money from the state, it's the same thing. You can't have a free economy without a free mm -hmm. currency. And if you have a free currency or a currency with integrity, you will get a, a free economy, right? And you'll get all these things. So they're kind of the same thing. The Austrians have seen it, right? Hayek saw it. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan said, he said, you know, government's not the solution. Government's the problem, right? And, and so the best part of the conservative movement was get the government out of the lives of the people. On the progressive side, I can find lots of progressive politicians that say, you know, the government shouldn't be in your bedroom telling you how to act, right? So... So there are people on the left that think the government is the problem. There are people on the right that think the government is the problem. There, the ca the capitalist movement used to be about letting the free markets function, right? So all of these people, they all they all have this similar theme embedded in the, the heart of their ideology, but in the absence of a uh, a, a technology solution. There is no way you can constructively channel all the energies of the people, right? So if you, what, regardless of your ideology, right, the world starts to be a better place when you run the railroad from east to west, or when you uh, when you get people running water, or when when you created steel, or when you created aluminum and you started to fly, or when you created antibiotics. At, at that point, the world started to get better. And until that point, for a thousand years, people just argue over what God meant in this, in this particular, you know, verse in the Bible. But you know, argue, winning the argument or losing the argument doesn't change the human condition. Not really. It just, you know, you're you're the new guy in charge, and there used to be somebody else in charge, and the endless cycle continues. So. I put together the speech with that idea. How, how do we explain to people in the objectivist movement why they should support Bitcoin? And, uh, and, and uh, of course, the theme of the book is we're going to go on strike. And uh, the point I make is there's no point going on strike if you didn't think to form the union first. <laughs> There's no example of anybody that ever went on strike and benefited before they formed the union, right? Going on strike without the union is like holding your breath until your parents give you what you want. Hopefully, your parents will notice that you're about to pass out. But if, they don't, if they're not there and you're holding your breath, you're just going to pass out, which is lucky for you because that's probably the best it's going to be. If you, if you go on strike in the wilderness, then you're just going to die <laughs> and you're a martyr. And I... I think that um, that's the best that can happen when you're an idealist and you don't have a solution, right? It's like, you're the valiant, right? Whatever it is. So I guess Socrates, right? He went to his death and he got to give a speech. And luckily for him, the speech was recorded by one of his pupils and passed down. But if he had simply just gone to his death without giving the speech, you know, what would he have accomplished from you know, the entire exercise. Yeah. Well, um, there's a lot to unpack there. I'd love to kind of get into a little bit about where technology has gone and how far technology has come. I mean, you famously wrote the book, The Mobile Wave, and saw, and was very prescient where this was going. Is is that the last frontier? And do, do you think people in that room understood how, much control and centralization is happening uh, within those systems. I I think um, everybody is everybody is beginning to perceive that we're in a new domain that uh, that exceeds the centralization or the uh, the authority of any previous time in human history. I think everybody's perceiving that. I don't think everybody can can articulate all ninety nine dimensions of this uh, of this movement, and uh, and I'm not sure I want to. I mean, I, I could, but <laughs> mm -hmm. Cedric, there's uh, here's my view on communications. It's like a pyramid. Um, there's a hundred things you think 
there's 10 things that you do in order to make a living or get on with your life. And there's one thing you can probably say, and you should figure out what that one thing is. Uh, because when you get out of your lane and uh, you get off message, it becomes uh, dysfunctional. So, so like, I don't wade into politics. It's above my pay grade, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't see it's very constructive to criticize the hundred things in the world that I can't change. Mm. I have private opinions about them, but, but ultimately I, I think that the question is, what can you do that is constructive? Like, go about your life in a cheerful and constructive way. And it, if you have these hundred opinions, right, then you ought to ask yourself the question, what can you do in order to make the world better across these hundred dimensions? Maybe you'll do 10 things. And then maybe you'll say one thing. What what I have observed is generally when you start to say two, three, or four things, mm. you accomplish nothing. Right. In fact, in fact, uh, I mean, this would be my advice generally uh, to people in the modern world. We, you see it in politics, right? Like, if you're if you're a politician and you stand for something, you need to stay on message. And if you start to drift off message, right, you get torn to pieces from from either wing of your own party, the opposite party, et cetera. And that's the challenge. I think if we go back uh, 10 years to the mobile wave, the point, the point that I made in the mobile wave is that software is dematerialized uh, or, or things are dematerializing into software as the software runs on a mobile device and the mobile device becomes part of your clothing and part of your persona, then things that previously were thought to be products or services or ideas were now manifest. So for example, um, your friendships were, uh, they, they were aspects of yourself before the mobile wave, but after the mobile wave, your friendships uh, became digitized in your relationships on Facebook or your relationships on social media or Snapchat, right? And it started to warp your friendships and, and uh, a photo was no longer a product. It was a piece of software, a piece of data and a communication that was spoken now became a digital communication. And once you start to see the digital transformation of things, the digital transformation of friendships, the digital transformation of communication, the digital transformation of video, of audio, of photo, then you start to see digital transformation of politics. Uh, and um, and all of these things have, uh, they have a profound impact on the human condition. And you know what? Uh, they can be toxic to the human condition. Uh, but also they they result in this massive uh, massive centralization of power and control. So a hundred years ago, you couldn't um, you couldn't dictate the answer to a question to a billion people centrally, even if you wanted to, right? Uh, because the answer to the question came from an organic interaction and maybe maybe I would refer to a book and maybe I would refer to a, somebody else. But, but the rate at which the question got answered was, was uh, a thousand X slower, a thousand X more expensive. And so information didn't move through the medium. The, the, fr the frequency, the natural frequency of the system was much, much slower and um, the impedance was much, much higher. And today, of course, um, there's a few companies in the world that can actually give you the question and give you the answer to the question before you ask it, and they can do it overnight. Right? And if we if we take uh, if we take maybe uh, you know a more anodyne example, it would be uh, you knew the world was uh, was going in an interesting direction when the uh, the Twitter cane hit. The Twitter cane is a uh, Hurricane Irma. If you remember Hurricane Irma, uh, a hurricane in the age of Twitter, 
hurricanes have been hitting the earth for millions of years and hurricanes have been hitting Florida for hundreds of years, right? Uh, and storms have been always with us in Europe and Africa and everywhere. But we never had the combination of storms and Twitter. So so around uh, what, 2016 or in that, in that time frame, we go back and check the date on Hurricane Irma, uh, the middle of the decade, a storm starts to form over the Caribbean. And, um, you know, there's a thousand different trajectories for that storm. And it's going to take two weeks to make landfall in Florida. Okay, so there's a 99.9% .9 chance that the storm is going to miss anything of substance. That's just what happens with storms. So what happens next? Well, weather forecasters start to tweet about the storm. You know, now, have you ever tweeted, you know, on Twitter, if you tweet something which is uh, boring, there's a storm forming over the Caribbean, but it's unlikely to make landfall or have any meaningful effect on anyone. That gets two likes, no retweets. So if instead you tweeted, there's a storm forming over the Caribbean, but if it hits Miami Beach, it's going to put a wall of 20 feet of water across the beach and it's going to wipe out 500,000 people and people are going to die. Okay, that gets picked up. Mm -hmm. So that starts to, that gets retweeted a thousand times. So then what happens is one person tweets that, and then the next weather forecaster thinks, wait a minute, they're getting all my traffic. I'm going to overtweet them. So they so they're like, the first person goes, well, there's a storm. It has one percent chance of hitting. Next person mm -hmm. goes, well, there's a storm. You know, I think it's going to hit. The next one's like, it's a storm. It's definitely going to hit. The next one is. It's a storm. It's going to hit, but there's a there's a total scandal because the you know the mayor's not doing anything about it. The next is well, you know I'm not going to be the mayor. Not on my watch. I'm going to do something about it. The next thing that happens is 47 mayors do something about it. The next thing that happens is the governor's involved. The next thing that happens is the Weather Channel is running this thing full full time for two weeks. There's the Hurricane Irma watch. All of a sudden, the advertisers are jumping on top of it. My people are glued to it. Okay, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Well, I mean, I live in Miami Beach. I got a house in Miami, <laughs> and I and my my other family they they live in um in uh, Sarasota. That's where I'm at. So I don't know. But then maybe if you were here around the time of Irma, you remember what happened. They um they build a huge fervor, like uh, it becomes it becomes the biggest story in the East Coast for a week, two weeks. And um, they declare martial law in Florida and they declare martial law in Miami and they forcibly evacuate Miami Beach. They make everybody leave under pain of arrest. You can't stay because the storm, one of the trajectories of the storm has hit Miami. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, everybody's well-intentioned, right? I mean. It, out of an abundance of caution, we need to evacuate. Okay, well, so what could go wrong? We're going to evacuate an entire city in the face of a storm. Okay, so then they go door to door, knocking on doors to make sure that no one's in, in their houses. Of course, if anybody wanted to loot or break in, it's the perfect time to do it, right? They've emptied the entire city. They shut down all the businesses. And then everybody that evacuates fills up all the hotels. You know, hotel prices spike, businesses suffer carnage, massive, you know, massive distress. A lot of people leave the state. And then the ones that can, they evacuate and they go to Sarasota because that's where all of the authorities that be tell them they should go to escape the hurricane. And the last day, the hurricane switches direction, slams right into Sarasota. Like like direct hit, they have evacuated everybody out of the place it missed into the place it's going to hit, doing Lord knows how many billions, tens of billions of dollars of damage. Everybody's fine in Sarasota. <laughs> like, I call, you know, I call members of my family, okay, well, oh yeah, we're fine, just bad storm, it's okay. Okay, so then, so then eventually everybody says, well, you know, I guess, I guess we were wrong about that, but we had to do it out of an abundance of caution. Shut down the entire economy for two weeks because of a seasonal storm. 
Now, what's different? Was was the hurricane worse? No, the hurricane was routine. What's worse is the combination of of the social media, the 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 the, the deathly combination is social media and Twitter, you know, Facebook, Twitter, the like, combined with cable news, like 24-7 news media that runs the story that wants to run the story. It's like, I, I can run, you know, the Hurricane Irma story for 168 hours straight selling advertisement. So if I told you the hurricane was nothing, it's like, well, well who's going to pay for that? Who's going to watch that? <laughs> so you ended up with, um, I, I would say, this is like uh, auto inflammatory disease or like you get to a certain age and you get allergies when you're young you don't get allergies and age 21 all of a sudden you've got hay fever and you try to figure out why they say well you know the antibodies just build up in your system your system gets more sensitive and then one day you know you're in the presence of a pathogen and you just start uncontrollably sneezing because it's an exponential process you know just like you wonder you know how, how could i like eat a peanut and have it kill me how do i go into anaphylactic shock over something and I think uh, I think what you see is the nervous system of the world. The nervous system of the world has 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 become too advanced, so that so that all of these uh, all of these social media mm. systems they're wired like uh, everybody's seeing everything. You know, you remember when the pandemic hit? They're actually posting pictures of people dropping dead on the streets in China, and those go viral, and everybody thinks, "Oh my God, this is awful." Well, then a year later, where are all those videos? They're gone. It turns out that they were all fakes. Hmm. People, people weren't dropping dead in the streets in China, but somehow they got going just like, you know, lots of things flow on social media and uh, they go viral. So I think here what's happened is the civilization has all of its nervous systems cross uh, cross-correlated and the natural frequencies are too short mm. and so there's a resonating frequency and when you strike something with a resonating frequency it the signal gets amplified a million to one 10 million to one there's a reward to amplify the signal there's there's a reward function for inflammatory behavior online like the the thing if it bleeds it leads at some point i had i used to have facebook and i stopped using it and the reason i stopped using it this is like five years ago six years ago whenever i opened my news feed i had i had five thousand friends okay so as many as you get right i maxed out on hmm. friends when i opened my news feed i didn't get a flat neutral news feed first in first out of whatever they were saying right. what i got was the most angry most upset or a most despondent of my friends nonstop. like oh uh somebody in my family just died and i want to kill myself oh uh i the world is coming to an end and i want to murder these people oh this you won't believe how you know here's a picture of things being murdered and bloody and their heads chopped off and being crunched. And isn't this horrifying? And I just got this never ending stream of horrifying, inflammatory, toxic stuff. And I said, I know that 92% of my friends aren't suffering from horrific anger, angst and despondence and tragedy right now, but the newsfeed makes it look like that. And I couldn't get rid of it. Right. It's just like every day I'm going to sift through your 5,000 friends and find the one that's going to make you the most upset. And I'm going to put that in front of your face and keep poking you. And so that that algorithm, I think it just kind of went toxic. And I see the same thing with uh, with all of these big tech companies where the algorithm is toxic. The people are rewarded uh, for amplifying toxicity to make it worse, to make it worse, you know, like when I post on Twitter, like this morning I posted on Twitter, I had uh, 498 comments in the first uh, few minutes. 
-hmm. and 95 percent of them aren't people right. you know it's like i you know 98 percent aren't people i have to wait right but it's so what you've got is is you have toxic trolls you know and they just make the most toxic comments you have inflammatory uh inflammatory posters and then you have uh, malefactors that have bots that are actually stoking the bots and for whatever reason you know a lot of the social media platforms can't stop them and then you've got other mainstream mainstream actors right that once the idea of the twitter cane once the idea of the hurricane was gonna hit miami got stuck in people's minds and it's it's a silly thing because a week out right any any statistician would say there's not more than a one percent chance it's going to do that you knew that a week out but there's no money to be made in mm. that. And so once that idea was introduced, that little fleck, you know, that little irritant was introduced. Everybody on Twitter jumped on it. Then everybody in cable media jumped on it. Then everybody in the weather business jumped on it. Then the mainstream media jumped on it because they don't want to be outdone by the weather people. If it's a crisis for the Weather Channel, it must be a crisis mm -hmm. for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. We're going to get it. Then it gets into mainstream cable, right? Why not just cover it on you know, CNN and CNBC and Fox and the like, because we don't want to be outdone by the story. And then every local politician and then every mayor and then every police chief gets to jump on it. And then the governor gets to jump on it. Pretty soon FEMA is involved in the White House as a statement. Okay, so you saw all this happening for Hurricane Irma. That was your wake up call, right? That was like the, right? That was the warning shot. Hmm. And then, uh, you know, what happens next? Well, I'm not going to go into the details what happens over the next four years because many books have been written about it. But, but you know, around 2020, right, we see, we see a, a, a reaction, an allergic reaction where the entire world goes into anaphylactic shock. Hmm. Right? So when I say, you know, coming back to Lord Atkin, right, you know, Lord Acton, right? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. We've always had absolute power for a million years. We've, I mean, we've never had a period where somebody with power wanted to take advantage of somebody else, right? And we've never had an example where it didn't go to their head, right? Read Shakespeare, you know, read read the Bible, read, you know, everything. Every religious text or every every ancient text in every culture has got the story. That's not new. What's new is the natural frequency of the communication systems is much higher. The impedance of information flow is much lower. And, uh, and the power is much more extreme. Every authority, right? A hundred years ago, right, if there was a medical authority, they might have had the power to issue some edict and 90% of the people wouldn't have even known it was issued, mm. right? But they, but they wouldn't have the power to put a little ticker like halfway down the screen on every screen you look at every minute of the day for the next three years for 5 billion people, right? <laughs> if I could reach into your eye and I could pry open your eye and I could like plant something, mm. right? The blue sky is going to kill you. The blue sky is going to kill you. The blue sky is going to kill you. If I just put it right there for 5 billion people, even if it's not true, it's going to work, right? It's going to, it's going to drive some portion of the people insane and drive the rest off their rocker because, you know, I, I, I honestly believe the blue sky was bad for you, Cedric. I mean, I, I was trying to help. Like just like that, everybody was trying to help when the hurricane was coming our way. They're trying to help. Statistically, the damage done by declaring martial law on the entire eastern seaboard and and uh, ejecting everybody from their homes is a hundred x, a thousand x, ten thousand x greater than the statistical damage that would be done if you got hit by the hurricane head on. But you know when you when you have um a society where everybody feels like it's their job to help, right? Everybody's trying to do too much. Mm. And, and, uh, and we see that forming. And I think the, you know, I'll, I'll make one last point and I'll stop. The biological metaphor here is, uh, 
it's autoimmune disease and allergy, right? Like, you know, you get to a point where you're allergic to everything. It's higher order vertebrates with very sophisticated nervous systems that are allergic to everything. You know, a, a bacteria doesn't go into anaphylactic shock when they smell a peanut, right? It's, you know, simple creatures don't have that problem, right? As, as your nervous system gets more sophisticated, as you get more wired, the, you know, the classic, you know, the classic uh, metabolic disease or the classic problem is, is um, I engage in inflammatory behavior over and over again. Like I continually smoke, drink, eat too much, dose myself with liquid sugar, something like that where I'm, or, or, or just like, you know, I, um, Maybe I damage my knees, I damage my joints, right? Or, mm. you know, anything that's grinding down your hard tissue or you're your, um, continually cycling your insulin levels or you're continually jamming tar and nicotine in your lungs, anything like that, uh, it stresses the body. And over time, the body reacts and eventually the body reacts with, you know, with some kind of allergic reaction with in, and with inflammation, right? And most, most things that shorten our life are caused by inflammation, right? Inflammation of the arteries, mm -hmm. inflammation of the heart, inflammation of the digestive tract, inflammation of the joints, all of these things. They're infl you engage in inflammatory behavior and there are consequences. And I think what you can see is that technology has introduced uh, new forms of inflammation into the civilization. And we just were at a very vulnerable point over the past few years where after, after enough encroaching technology and enough strengthening of authority and then enough inflammatory behavior, right? The, it's like the entire body politics shut down. And uh, now we're left with the challenge of what are you going to do about it? Right? What, what is the solution when you, you know, when you're suffering from autoimmune disease or, or you're suffering from metabolic disease or, or, or extreme allergies or extreme inflammation, you know, and um, there's a book called the fasting cure written by um, Up Upton Sinclair, 1909, I think. It's free, copyrights expired, anybody could read it. And what Upton Sinclair says in this book, he's very, very smart. He says, uh, I talk to everybody, I look at everybody, and, and uh, what I notice in the world of today, and the world of today, of course, is 100 years ago, he says, I notice doctors are prescribing too many uh, cures that don't work. And I notice people are engaging in you know, they smoke too much, they drink too much, they eat too much, and they and they uh, ingest bad medicines, and they undergo surgeries that are bad for them. And, uh, and my conclusion is 80% of all of these ailments could be cured by just stop eating. Just stop. Like, that's the cure. It says, I've noticed in nature when animals are, are sick or ill, they stop eating. And in my own life, whenever I'm ill, I just stop eating for a week, for two weeks, it won't kill you. <laughs> Takes all the load off your systems and, uh, and the body naturally heals itself. That is the fasting cure. He discovered that, he wrote it. It's extremely well-researched. It's a brilliant book. Like uh, you're, you're shocked because he was like an influencer in his time. He wrote these other very famous books, right? He's well known for. Um, and, uh, and so he had thousands of people writing him letters. And he said, so I asked 3,000 people that follow me, you know, 3,000 of my fans, they all wrote me letters and I compiled all of the answers and I found that 82% of them were able to succeed by doing this. And this is kind of the equivalent of running a Twitter poll. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think that this is, this is age old wisdom, you know, that, that uh, it, it, it pops up every hundred years or 200 years, then it goes away, <laughs> you know. Caesar, uh, uh, Emperor Augustus, you know, uh, lived, I think, to 72. And, uh, and his, his uh, explanation for how he lived that long, and that was much longer than most Romans, he said, I ate light. 
like a don't eat that much eat you know very sparingly people overeat and he had pro he had some problems and the way he cured them is by cutting his intake and then uh john d rockefeller if you read his biography he he financed the entire medical school system in the united states like he you know he he underwrote it all so he basically supported all sorts of uh, research institutions to develop, you know, the science of modern medicine, the Rockefeller Institute, you know, and and made huge donations, in, you know, in pursuit of vaccines and pursuit of, of modern medical techniques. But he never trusted the doctors. And so he was into homeopathic medicine, his like natural medicine. So he never trusted the doctors. What he was known for was he didn't smoke. He didn't drink. He was a practicing Baptist. He was austere in his lifestyle. He was thin his entire life. He exercised every day. He stayed active into his 70s, 80s, and 90s. And he lived to be 99 and three quarters. Mm. And he outlived all of his doctors, which is amusing. He, everybody that preached to him, that had all this useful advice for him, you know, he outlived them all and he outlived them all by exercise, you know, <laughs> thought, ca careful thought about what he put into his body. Right. And a cheerful disposition. And uh, I think there's an object lesson in there. Tremendously. Yeah. Uh, I'm enjoying this so much. Uh, I want to turn to one of your quotes from your speech because it, it reflects a lot of what you just said around like, when I hear inflammation in society and, and sort of like we're fighting a virus. So most people don't realize this, but Satoshi opened a portal from the physical realm into the digital realm and energy began to flow into cyberspace, bringing life to a formerly dead realm consisting only of shadows and ghosts. So I first heard that, I think on your talk with Preston, we talked about the bots on Twitter and how this is a dead realm. How did, what Satoshi did on January 3rd, 2009, breathe life into cyberspace. Well, let's, I mean, let's start with why cyberspace is dead. What is a shadow? Uh, a, a shadow, just like, you know, Plato's, you know, analogy of shadows in the cave. A shadow is, is an image of something in the real world. So the shadows in cyberspace are credit. So like when you're, when you're circulating a hundred dollars on a credit network, right? The hundred dollars doesn't exist on the network. It's a shadow of something that exists. Right? It's a shadow of a shadow, right? <laughs> Ultimately. Right. And if the bank decays the deal, the money didn't change hands. So when I represent something in cyberspace, I represent, for example, that, that I am uh, me and I get a blue check. Okay, and and that is a certification by a trusted third party, right? Twitter is the trusted third party, and my persona in cyberspace is a shadow of me. Okay, so credit is a shadow of money, and avatars, you know, on Facebook or YouTube or whatever, are are, are shadows of people. And then what are the ghosts? I mean, the ghosts are the bots, right? The ghosts are, you know. When you go to YouTube and Michael Saylor is doing a Bitcoin giveaway and there are 25,000 people listening, they're not even shadows. They're 25,000 ghosts that were conjured up by a, cyber, a, cyber, a neuromancer, right? Cybermancer, who's just, you know, uh, writing code. So, so the status quo of the internet before Satoshi is, is everything is an image, a shadow of the reality right? Uh, and a credit reflection of reality based on one or more trusted third party or one or more counterparties. And they all have counterparty risk, right? Because mm. like today on Twitter, in my, uh, in my notifications, I had 10 Elon Musk Bitcoin giveaways pop up with blue checks. Okay. So do I trust the blue checks? No, because I'm smart enough to realize that 10 blue check Elon Musk Bitcoin giveaways are obviously hijacked, uh, hijacked um, personas or hijacked avatars. So what you have is, um, you know, those are like bounce checks, Cedric, right? It's like they're they're bad checks, ten of them. And if I, you know, I look at the check, and if mm. someone gave you ten checks for a million dollars each, written on the Bank of America, you could say, 
this is great. I'm going to give you my $10 million building and take your checks because it's signed by Bank of America. Or you would say, no, there's no way that, you know, you've got 10, $1 million checks or something fishier. I'm not giving you my building and I'm going to call and I'm going to find out that they're all bounced checks. They're not real. They're check kiting. So we have this It's pernicious. It's all over cyberspace. And uh, the result is you've got denial of service attacks. You've got phishing scams. You've got, you've got, uh, I've got an inbox. My, my uh, inbox and Twitter is full of all sorts of random bot uh, phishing attacks and then random email list. And here's the, here's the catch. There's an API for them to spam me, but there's no API for me to delete it. So if I actually start to delete, I can actually spend an hour a day deleting the incoming spam. It, you know, it takes them a minute a day or a second a day. So I can't win. I can't even page through the spam. So if you, if you're in the um, if you're not one of my followers or I, I follow, if I don't follow you, then if I start to try to page through the inbox, it takes me about 25 seconds or, t or, or 10 seconds for the thing to page. And it's so slow that I can't get mm -hmm. through the list to figure out whether one in a thousand of them is a real message. Okay, so that's the world we live in right now. It's ghost screaming in your ear, right? It's If you walked into a room and there were 19 million ghosts and there was one person and the ghosts are making so much noise, you can't hear yourself. You can't see anything, right? You know, on the... On the uh, you ever watch, you know, read the read comic books like the X Men comic books or or these other superhero comic books? Well, one of the interesting tropes of the adult comic books is is when the superhero or the mutant gets the ability to read people's minds and gets telepathic, they don't have the ability to filter it, and so they start hearing everybody's thoughts. And as soon as you start hearing the thoughts of the entire civilization or a million people's thoughts, all the toxic thoughts get in your head and all the psycho thoughts get in your head and you go insane. Right. You, you don't want to be able to hear everybody's thoughts. Right. It will drive you insane, literally. Right. I mean, th think about what happens. And, and um, the closest thing to this happening in the real world to nice people is when you get on Twitter and you become uh, active on Twitter. Like I, I see these uh, these twenty somethings. They get on Twitter and and they maybe they haven't dealt with this hostility. They post something. You know the sky is blue and I'm looking forward to going to the park. And then what they get attacked by nineteen hundred evil malicious trolls. And then they get attacked by 15 people that simply want to hijack their followers by calling them moronic, stupid enemies of the people. Right. And then there's someone else that's going to murder them. And then there's some other diabolical freaking demon, right? That calls out of this and it gives people mental health problems. Like, like literally they'll go, I'm suicidal or, or, you know, I, I can't focus. And, um, when I talk to them in private, I say, look, here's my advice, Insta block. Like if someone disrespects you or something like that, you can't even think about it for a hundred milliseconds. Right. You literally have to go, uh, oh, Blake. Like, you know how long it takes to figure out whether the person that just, you know, ripped you to shreds in the most diabolical way. How long it takes to figure out whether they're even a person? It, it takes like a minute or two minutes to figure out if they're a person. And it happens that there are malefactors that are launching 10 million of those things a month. So if you take two minutes times 10,000 to figure out that they're, they're, per so what does it matter if they're a person or not? Right. Doesn't matter. Right. Um, if they are a person, you need to insta block because they're just an awful person. And if they're not a person, that's even more diabolical. Some evil person with a political agenda or some other agenda anti yours or counter yours has launched 18,000 non-persons to distract you and to uh, and to bend the conversation uh, in their direction because there are no consequences. So, so we live... <laughs> 
if you lived in a world where your worst enemy could launch 19 million demons to murder you, right? It wouldn't be a good world. You better find a spell that makes them go away, right? right. You're not long for the world. In cyberspace, you are in a world where your worst enemy can launch 19 million demons. And maybe it's to hurt you, or maybe it's to scramble you, or, or maybe it's just to steal from random people. Do you know how often those uh, Michael Saylor Bitcoin giveaways spin up on YouTube on a good week? Every 15 minutes. There's 25,000 people listening every 15 minutes. You know how many people I have tracking it to shut them down? Three. Okay. If you can spend a million dollars a year, 24 7, 365, you can report. Uh, 500 or a thousand of these things a week. There's a, there's a, a delay of two to eight hours before they take them offline and they just spin them up with another script. Like they're still happening. The only reason they stop happening is they just pick someone else to troll. They just, they right. just plug in there that, you know, it used to be the Winklevoss, you know, twins, and then it was Elon and then it was Vitalik and then it was me and it goes back. So that's the problem in the dead realm, right? And I think it is a pro. I mean, you want to trust your 16 year old daughter in that realm? Look, I'm a grown man, right? Like I am 57 years old and I have lived through, you know, 99 chapters of brutality of people behaving badly toward other people. And I go online and I still deal, I see all these, these sh shenanigans and I have resources that most people don't have. Right. <laughs> and I, and yet it's still a challenge, hmm. right? Like I still have to be very careful. So I, you know, a 21 year old that's operating by themselves in cyberspace. It's like maybe like your 21 year old wandering through a war zone city with, you know, everybody running around with guns and, and three sides and four warlords and bombs falling out of the sky. It's not a safe place, right? It's, it's a, it's a problem for corporations. It's a problem for individuals. It's a problem for everything. So that is the dead realm. What does Satoshi do? Well, Satoshi, uh, gave us uh, the ability uh, to move something of tangible value from point A to point B through cyberspace without a trusted third party, right? We solved the Byzantine generals problem. We also solved the problem of how we move money between two parties without a trusted intermediary, right? Uh, we, and, and that is about as far as most people go. Like that, they say, well, Satoshi solved the, oh, the lowbrow, you know, the lowbrow thing is people say Satoshi solved the double spend problem. Okay. Well, when I was a freshman at MIT, we never, never would have used the word double spend, right? It's just like what it was a vernacular, right? Or a colloquialism of some sort, right? Uh, we would have said, uh, Satoshi implemented conservation of energy in mm. cyberspace, right? When you solve the double spend problem, what that means is when there are a thousand units and I give you 500, I have 500 left and there are still a thousand units. That is conservation of energy. When I don't solve the problem, I give you a thousand, uh, 500 units and I keep a thousand. Now there's 1500 units and the next person gives their 500 to someone else and now it's 2000 units, right? So now I don't have concept, I have a non-conservative transaction and non-conservative transactions take place everywhere in the digital realm, right? That's the, that's the basic underpinning of Napster of the web, mm -hmm. digital music, digital photos, all sharing is non-conservative transactions. Right. And and there are a lot of a lot of examples in the civilization where you want a non-conservative transaction. Like if you're trying to actually share Beethoven's Fifth Symphony to a billion people, right? You you want the conservative way to do it was 150 years ago, you had an orchestra in the king's parlor. And if you were one of 100 people sitting there in the room, you could hear the symphony. And no one else could hear the symphony because the orchestra could only be in one place at one time. 
And after it was done, no one could hear the symphony and you didn't get to share the symphony. And unless you were a king, you didn't get the orchestra. That was a conservative way for music and music was scarce and music was the province of kings, right? Hmm. But music became not scarce, you know, sometime after the iPod and Napster and MP3s hit. Music is not scarce anymore. Music is a gift given to, it's a utilitarian entitlement of sorts. You know, you can have 50 million songs at your fingertips for $9 a month. When I was at MIT, um, when I was at MIT, the guys used to impress women with their uh, record collections. That's how you picked up girls, right? Like, come check out, I have like all these records. Or, or you know, if you really liked a girl, you wanted to give her a gift, you gave her a mixtape. Right. Like I, and you gave her a mixtape on the high end Maxwell, like magnetic, you know, tape, the high quality stuff, not the cheap stuff. So that's because music was scarce and desirable. And, uh, and it became not scarce when, um, when, it, when we were able to transfer digital music in a non-conservative fashion. Now, what Satoshi did was something that no other digital pioneer had solved, right? I mean, when we invented Linux and HTML and when we, you know, when we invented the semiconductor and the internet and email, these were all great breakthroughs, but, but nobody solved the problem of implementing conservation of energy in cyberspace. And uh, so what I, what I point out here is if you think about it deeply enough, and you have, you have to think about it not from the point of view of a computer scientist. Look, at MIT, I used to make fun of the computer scientists, okay? All the engineers made fun of the computer scientists because we thought they were like the, what, what is the word? They were the sloppy... You know the 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 sloppy, undisciplined engineers because they didn't have to study thermodynamics and fluid mechanics and structural engineering and mm. you know mechanical engineering and and you know physics and chemistry and these are all hard things, right? And we used to make fun like uh, the software engineers. All they do is they write a few lines of code and. And they can, you know, the, the truth is I'm being a bit hyperbolic because the really good ones, right? The really good software engineers under, you know, understood algorithms and, and there was a right and a wrong way to implement a sort algorithm. And the wrong way is, you know, 10X or 100X more inefficient. But of course, over time, the computer chips got more powerful and the world became full of sloppy software engineers because you could write garbage code that's a million times less efficient than it needs to be, but it was, you know, 10,000 times easier to write. Right. And so in the world of software engineering, I think we get a lot of intellectual sloppiness. And to understand what, what Satoshi was doing, you have to be a general, a systems engineer. You have to be an aeronautical engineer, or you have to, you have to design systems of some sort where you have a sense of thermodynamics and fluid dynamics, and control engineering, uh, and you know, servo mechanisms, cybernetics, uh, higher order systems, something as simple as like a difficulty adjustment. It's a first order feedback loop. It's a first order negative feedback loop. Okay, you learn it pretty quickly in a hardcore engineering uh, discipline. Well, it's the basis of a thermostat. You know, the, they they built them in steam engines to keep the steam engines from blowing up and killing everybody, right? Uh, you know, governors, right? Um, so, so I think that uh, what Satoshi did, oftentimes it's it's undersold because it's communicated in a colloquial way by software engineers or by maybe by uh, accountants to each other, right? And they, they use the language of accounting or they use the language of money transfer. The problem with using, you know, political language, economic language, or even monetary principles is those are not engineering disciplines until Satoshi came along. See, before, like even the Austrian economics who are the closest thing to engineers in the economics realm, they're not engineers because we think about it. When the Austrians wrote everything about money, there was no example of a perfect money in the history of the world. And so they'd never actually lived in a civilization with um, 
anything that looked like mathematically correct money. Like many people like point toward gold, but you know, as we realize, gold's not mathematically correct money. Gold, gold is money with a drift in it and a leak in it, which is uh it it's simply less bad than everything else. So the economist, the monetary theorists, the politicians, the accountants, they all, you know, they all struggled with their own metaphors. The, the people that have the stronger metaphors and the stronger uh, mathematical models are the physicist, like hardcore physicist, uh, mechanical engineers, aeronautical engineers, systems engineers, electrical engineers, to, and, and generally anyone that had to build uh, systems that were subject to Maxwell's equations or Newtonian laws, you know, phys physical laws or mathematical laws. And if you look at the, if you look at the degree of variance, right? Uh, if you built any kind of physical system, uh, like look at a Roman aqueduct designed 2,200 years ago, and they had to design those systems, uh, the, the inclines of the systems with effectively, you know, no leakage and uh, a few basis mm. points of variation over the course of 40 miles. Like that, they knew exactly, this is gonna be a 37 basis point declination. And if I'm off plus or minus five basis points, I'm not gonna make it, it's not gonna work, right? So engineers for, the, for thousands of years, have had very precise tolerances. You can't be off by 1% or it just doesn't work. Not only does it not work, everybody dies, right. right? And economists have been dealing, the best The best money we ever had, which was gold is off by two to 4% at any given normal year. And in bad years, like the conquistadors come back with a big gold find from the Incas, it's <laughs> off by 15% or 20%. Right. You know, Julius Caesar conquers Gaul and comes back to Rome and creates hyperinflation because he brings too much gold back. Okay, so so we've never had a really good answer, right, in the world of uh, of currency, and therefore it never really reached the level of engineering. And so that's why I think um, people don't always understand it. But coming back to your point, so Satoshi implements the the solution to transfer value through cyberspace. If I put a billion dollars into a wallet and I've got the private keys, by transferring the private keys to you, I've transferred the billion dollars. In a, you know, and that's a very interesting idea, right? In a conservative fashion, right? The first person that decides to, to tap into those is getting the money. And the next person is not, and they're coming up empty. So, most people stop there because they think that's a revolution in banking. And it it sort of is, but the idea of being able to move a million dollars from you know, New York to Tokyo is only the second order idea. It, it, it allows you to bypass the Fed and it, you know, it allows you to bypass all the credit layers. So you don't need the central bank. You don't need the correspondent bank. You don't need the credit card network, et cetera. Yeah, all, all nice. But what, I, what I've said tongue in cheek, if you go back some of my tweets, I said, the magic of Bitcoin is not transferring money to someone 10,000 miles away. It's transferring money to someone 10,000 days away. Mm. Right, it's, it's, it's a much bigger idea, right? That, the minor idea is I transfer the money through space cross domains point to point <clears throat> in cyberspace. The bigger idea is I manifest the money in cyberspace because something in cyberspace never dies. Just like if I put if I put something in orbit, the Hubble telescope, right? If I put it sufficiently in orbit and, and reach escape velocity, it orbits forever. It's forever, right? Right. If I can get out of the atmosphere, I can get out of uh, the zone of decay. So the real interesting idea here is not that I can send a billion dollars from point A to point B for a dollar, like a, which is whatever, a thousand X, 10, a, a million X cheaper. 
if I can move money a million X cheaper, that's an idea. But the idea that I could put the billion dollars into cyberspace at all, where it will be uncorrupted and immortal and last for a million years, that's a much bigger idea. And then the biggest idea, hmm. the biggest idea is that um, once I put it in cyberspace, it's not just immortal, it's it's pure energy, right? I, I, people get confused about energy because, uh, and we could talk about it a bit. The truth is it's even better than energy, it's scarcity. Uh, and we, I, I'll explain why in a second. Um, energy is something tangible in the universe, but energy is not scarce, right? There's infinite energy in the universe. Mm. Every star has got infinite energy, com you know, compared to human requirements. So there's plenty of energy in the universe, but energy is commodity and it is value. And so if I give you a million barrels of oil and you can pump a million barrels of oil a day out of the ground, you're rich and, and you've got value. It's not a scarcity though, it's a commodity because, because there's no cap on it. So if I could actually inject digital barrels of oil into cyberspace, and if I, if I told you I was gonna give you 5 million digital barrels of oil a day in cyberspace, you would also be rich and happy, right? I, I mean, I, I see the smile on your face, so that's good. Um, but uh, it's still not scarcity because you can't stop anybody else from creating energy, right? The problem with your 5 million barrel of oil a day monopoly is if I create nuclear power plants and I don't need oil, or if I create fusion reactors mm -hmm. and I give you a fusion reactor the size of a thermos that'll generate enough power to light up a city for a year off of you know eight ounces of water, the oil as a commodity gets demonetized, you see? The utility function of oil is going to crash when the machines of the civilization don't require oil. When the machines of the civilization require natural gas, natural gas has utility. So energy has value in the real world. If I put energy into cyberspace, it also has value. But there's something better than digital energy. It's digital scarcity. And the idea of digital scarcity is it's not just that I'm bringing something of value into cyberspace. I'm creating something of value, which is ultimately scarce everywhere and forever in cyberspace. I'm creating 21 million blocks of value and no more. So what Satoshi did was he created the ability for you to move a block of value in the form of a digital commodity, which is also a digital scarcity from point A to point B, from a computer to a computer. Once he did that, then in theory, you can move that on a layer two or a layer three. We saw today Cash App released so, you know, a new degree of support for Lightning. So now I can move uh, a block of Bitcoin via Bitcoin transaction on layer one, or I can move it on a Lightning transaction layer two, or I can move it on a cash tag transaction, layer three. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that that is a pretty powerful idea. The idea that the thing that I'm moving is uh, a commodity is a leap forward for the entire digital revolution, because there is no other piece of information that has uh, that is a, that is actually money. That is, a, that is a bearer instrument that you can move from one computer to another computer. Everything else you can move in the digital realm is credit, right? If I send you $100 on a credit card network, it's credit and it's subject to counterparty risk and multiple layers of counterparty risk. So this is the only thing that's not credit that moves. Hmm. Now, if you look at the history of money, we build money, we build money on commodities glass beads, bales of tobacco, large stone coins, silver coins, copper coins, gold coins. They're all commodities. What's the best money? The, the scarcest commodity. It was gold, but now the scarcest commodity is Bitcoin. But B Bitcoin's not just double, triple, quadruple the stock to flow of gold, right? Bitcoin is in its terminal velocity or at an equilibrium. It is infinite, infinite stock to flow. 
But in fact, you could make a better argument. It's not just infinite stock to flow. It's not just that it's capped to 21 million, therefore infinite. It's negative stock to flow, right? Okay. Because any rational person can say, I know there's no way to get beyond 21 million, but I also know that the forces of entropy, mm -hmm. some dude is going to have their keys in their head and get caught in a traffic accident or a plane crash or, or drowned. And the keys will be lost forever. And that amount of Bitcoin will be removed from the system forever, never to be spent. And so force majeure acts of God, right? And acts of man are, are going to cause the Bitcoin supply to actually decrease from 21 million. We already, you know, Satoshi set an example, but we also know of other large blocks of Bitcoin that have been lost. So Bitcoin isn't just the best digital commodity money. It's the best digital money. It's, a, it's the best money because it, it's, it has transcended the phrase commodity. There is every other commodity in the world, be it a digital commodity or a physical commodity, is uh, uncapped. You can create more of it, right? Oranges, tobacco, copper, platinum, palladium, diamonds, oil, natural gas corn, whatever it is, right? So how many times in the history of mankind have we ever created a commodity which was capped absolutely once? Bitcoin. So Bitcoin's a scarcity. It's a, it, it's a new word. It's the first thing that ever qualified as that word. That's why everybody ignores it, right? When you use the word scarcity, everybody kind of like just arm waves it away because they don't actually see the significance of scarcity because they've never actually known scarcity. They think it's it's some kind of random, colorful, poetic descriptor. No, it's it's actually a noun with a specific meaning, which is which is a commodity with an absolute capped supply for all time. That is a scarcity. Now, why coming back to this point, what's the significance? The significance is. If I have a scarcity, if I if I if I have something of tangible value, um, then uh, I can move it at the speed of light, at the speed of a computer chip. I I can program it a, as fast as a, a CPU can think. Right. So two computers, right? Uh, you know, all the altcoiners, they just they're they're trapped in this in this uh, foolish notion that somehow. The Bitcoin is going to move at the speed of the layer one, but that's just as foolish as criticizing New York for being built on granite that hasn't moved in 200 million years. Wow. Right. It's just, it's a, yeah, the granite underneath Central Park hasn't moved in 200 million years. That's why it's not valuable. That's why it's Boomer Park. Right. The, the granite doesn't have to move. The granite's not supposed to move. Right. What moves is the stuff above the granite. Right. So Satoshi created something worth hundreds of billions that will be worth trillions, that'll be worth tens of trillions, that will be worth a hundred trillions in cyberspace. And you can build something on top of it. It's the only thing you can build on top of it. Right. It, it is, it's the first successful digital commodity. It's the it's the only known instance of a digital scarcity, right? Um, and coming back to this dilemma of living in in a realm of shadows and ghosts, how do I bring substance, form, and substance into cyberspace? Right? It's like I you have a coupon for a dozen eggs. I have the eggs. The coupon is credit. You hand me the coupon, I give you the eggs. The eggs have energy in them, right? Matter is energy, energy is matter. If I take the energy out of the eggs, you have a coupon. If I take the energy out of your oranges, you have a coupon. If I take the energy out of your 5 million barrels of oil, you have a coupon. If I trade it with investors, it's a security. Right, I'm trading. A, I'm I'm trading an IOU, a, a derivative contract on five million barrels of oil, but you don't have the oil. You have credit for the oil. Maybe I, and maybe you think you have a claim on it, 
And then I just tell you, I'm not going to honor your claim. That happened some number of months ago, I think uh, in the silver, was it the silver market or some metals market, right? There's a massive squeeze on metals and, and uh, you know, the metals exchange just decayed and unwound the deals. Yeah, you had, you had a claim, but we didn't follow through. So if we think about this and the consequence of this, I want to create consequence and time and substance and matter in cyberspace, right? Gigi's done some really great work on, on the relationship of Bitcoin and time, right? Like, how do you know that time is moving forward? How do you move? How, do you, how does time advance in cyberspace in an objective manner without a trusted third party, without a timekeeper? How do you how do you do that? Right. Right. You need proof of work to do that. There's the joke, right? If you know. In space, nobody can hear you scream. Right. That was the old uh, Stanley Kubrick line, I think. And uh, in cyberspace, if you die in cyberspace, do you really die? Hmm. Right. And this is the question of the matrix. And if you send your um, shadow into cyberspace, the answer is no. And if you send yourself into cyberspace, the answer is yes. So how, how do you die in cyberspace? Well, if I have a million dollars, right? You, you come to see me and, uh, and you want to get into my, uh, into my application, but I don't trust you. Because maybe, I've, maybe my application controls like uh, all the trains in the United States of America. And if you actually hack the train system, you're going to wreck the trains and kill people. So I want to know that I can trust you. So how do I trust you? So maybe you have to post a $10 million security deposit or a $100 million deposit. Like you represent to me that you're uh, the bank of America and you want to get into, into a vault where there's something valuable. Okay, post $100 million. How are you going to post $100 million of real money? Everything's credit except for Bitcoin, right? So the answer is, yeah, you know, you want to fix this, make people post real money. And the real money is give me $100 million of Bitcoin. Transfer it to me. Okay, if you can't transfer it, you don't possess it. You want to act, if you want access to software that puts a billion dollars of my assets at risk, then you have to post a security deposit. So, What's going on here, right? We now have a method um, to completely clean up all of cyberspace. Not just that, to create cyber structures. Can you create a wall in cyberspace? Sure. Like what if, what, what is a wall in real space? Um, what would happen to you if you ran into a wall as hard as you could? Like, It'd be bad. Yeah, you don't get to like appeal to your lawyer and say, sue the wall and reverse the transaction. If you jumped off of a hundred foot wall, you would be dead within about two seconds, right? There are consequences in the real world. That's that because that's energy. What, what killed you when you jump off a hundred foot wall? Physics. Energy, right? right. What, what happened is you converted, you had potential energy in your body. When you're 100 feet up, you have a lot of energy in your body. When you jump off the wall, that potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy. That kinetic energy slams you into the ground and and uh, kills you, breaks you. Okay, it's, it's the existence of energy in the real world that creates consequences with no uh, ability to appeal, right? The richest man in China fell off a wall um, while taking a selfie a few years ago on vacation in the south of France and died. And the guy was worth like $20 billion or $30 billion, and he was dead in like three seconds. Now, it, there's nothing in the political world or the economic world that would have killed him in three seconds. 
maybe not kill them at all because there's no consequence there, right? You've got armies of lawyers and the like. So what's the equivalent in cyberspace? Well, it'd be like, okay, how about this one? You want to post a comment on my, uh, on my Twitter feed? You have to post um, $100, right, uh, Bitcoin. Or post a million Satoshis. Okay, post a million Satoshis. A anybody that wants to comment, you want to DM me, post a million Satoshis. But the consequence is, if you attack me or try to fish me, or you're or you're scamming or spamming me, I get to hit forfeit, and then you either if you get blocked by me, then you lose your deposit, or lose ten percent of your deposit. That's how it works in a hotel, hmm. right? I mean, try checking into a luxury hotel right. without posting a credit card. Go into a hotel and then smash everything in the room and walk out, right? If you could do that. What if you could what if you could make 20 million copies of yourself, check into to every hotel room in the world, smash everything, and then disappear anonymously for free wow. by writing Python script? You, you, you see how that is a that is a universe of chaos. Right? You, you can't operate a hotel in cyberspace under those conditions, right? Okay, so how do you actually create a safe hotel in cyberspace? People have to post a security deposit, right? Maybe when Goldman Sachs posts a comment on, um, what if Goldman Sachs posts on Twitter, uh, on their Twitter account, and they post, well, you know, we think uh, we're about to like double our profit. We just announced it. Or we're going to quadruple our profit next year, raising guidance. Okay, and the stock trades up 50 billion dollars okay a lot of money changes hands so what if i hacked their account and i posted that could that happen yeah do, do blue checks get hacked i just told you 10 got hacked right in front of my face today right yeah they get hacked all the time okay so that's kind of interesting but now the question is, um, why wouldn't Goldman Sachs be willing to post ten million dollars worth of Bitcoin as a security deposit when they when they want to represent their avatar in cyberspace? How much money does a, a bank spend on the corner of New York City uh, to represent that they're stable? Mm. Have you ever seen the Goldman Sachs building in New York or the Bank of America building? In fact. I think it's axiomatic. The nicest building in every city in America is a bank building. <laughs> Just about, right? And so a bank shows up in a hometown and they build a hundred million dollar building to show that they're stable and reputable. And you walk into the building and you see the vault and you see the marble, et cetera. Okay. So if you want to spend a hundred million dollars in the real world to show stability, um, would you do it in the cyber world? Sure you would. But the issue is there are no consequences in the cyber world if you're posting credit. You have to actually post money. Yeah, you have to post the actual commodity or in this case, the actual scarcity, right? So what Satoshi did was Satoshi made it possible to create, uh, to, to, to monetize data. What, what, G, what Gigi would say is it, it's uh, reified information reified fancy word for uh, objectified ma made into an object uh, a tangible object okay so i give you a string of numbers what do they mean well they're really just a coupon to redeem a non-conservative file up until bitcoin right and and maybe they're a coupon to redeem a non-conservative piece of music or a photo or or whatever or maybe they're a key that may be honored by a bank in the real world but at the point that the string of numbers or you know the private key in whatever form it it flows at that at the point that that actually allows you to extract the value of a bitcoin wallet it's it's now um it's now money not credit it's now 
what what have you done? You've created digital energy. And I use the word energy because energy is conservative. Hmm. Anything that's conservative in the universe. As, as I said before, it's better than energy because it's scarcity. But if we just go with the with the idea of energy for now, anything that's conservative uh, that recognizes the law of conservation of energy, that's that's critical. Bitcoin is energy. It's conservative. Now, if I want to create matter, I need energy. Matter is is low frequency energy. Hmm. Right? Lightning strikes a tree. Lightning is the energy. The tree catches fire. It's the matter. And then all of a sudden there's fire and the fire is bright and there's light coming out of the fire. We're back to energy. Right? What we're seeing is this is this oscillation, right? Between uh you can change one form of matter to another form of matter. You can change one form of energy to another form of energy, right? With various frequencies. Um, but you couldn't do it in cyberspace before Satoshi. After Satoshi, you can do it. Now, to what extent? Well, to the extent that, uh, that the Bitcoin network holds something of value. The network is monetizing. Right now we've monetized to maybe four hundred billion dollars. So there's so there's something that looks like four hundred billion dollars worth of energy floating in cyberspace, and that means I can create something of uh, something that matters. You can create digital matter. Can I create um? Can I create a, a house or a wall in cyberspace that's got energy in it? Right, not before Bitcoin, but yes, after Bitcoin, I can. Now can I create something that stands alone? Like what if I actually create a, an intelligent, an AI program and the program is just going to operate for the next 10,000 years and I wanna finance it. I can launch a satellite into orbit and it will go around the sun for 10,000 years. And what is the price you pay? You have to escape the gravity well. The gravity well of the earth, maybe the gravity well you know, of um, of the moon, maybe the gravity well of the sun, depending on where you're trying to get it. So launching something into an orbit is the price you pay uh, in order to achieve what might be a 10,000 year run or a 100,000 year run or a million year run. Now, in cyberspace, I want to create, um, what if I want to create something which will just run for thousands and thousands of years? I can't fund it with um, a bank account. And I got, I got two problems, right? If I put $10 million into the bank account, well, the dollars are losing 7% of their value a year in a good year. So the, the dollar is going to lose 99% of its energy in 100 years. The bank's not going to last 100 years. What you've got is you've got a you've stacked counterparty risk. You've got the counterparty risk of the nation state on top of the counterparty risk of the state on top of the counterparty risk of the regulator of the bank on top of the counterparty risk of the bank on top of the counterparty risk of the person that runs the bank on top of the counterparty risk of the currency in the bank. You know, there's seven or eight layers of risk. You're not going to get 100 years. You'd be lucky to get 20 years, 30 years. So what you want to do is alleviate all that and you want to finance the entire thing with pure monetary energy floating in cyberspace. And that's what Bitcoin is. So I think what I'm saying when I, when I point this out is there's $400 trillion of monetized physical assets like real estate and gold and silver and commodities and equities and bonds and collectibles. And for the most part, the human civilization, you had a deep discussion with Croesus on this. I listened to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, deep discussion, you know, where he gets to about 400 trillion. That's monetized because no one had a better choice. No one, you, you didn't have an option to monetize something in cyberspace. And so Satoshi creates digital property. And if you create digital property, something that will hold value in cyberspace, you created digital matter.
and you created digital energy and you created digital money, right? All of, all of these things are just aspects, right? People use their house as a savings account, right? Right, they used to use gold as money and now they don't, but I chop it into a coin, maybe it would be again. So, and, and uh, is oil matter or is oil energy, right? Well, you know, I can, I can convert the one to the other and back again. So these are all just different aspects of each other, depending upon how fast you're vibrating or the frequency of the thing and the state of the thing. Uh, the big idea is the first 30 years of the internet, you had non-conservative digital applications. You had, dig you had digital information. And if you look at all of the great things that were invented, uh, you know, Facebook and Amazon and, and Google and, and uh, Twitter and the like and Apple and photos and books and records and maps, all of these are examples of uh, digital information flowing. They're non-conservative. Every single one of those things is a non-conservative application. And to the extent that they touch money or property, they're, uh, they're transacting in credit, right? They're, they're, uh, they're moving credit around. And ultimately, the final settlement is outside of the digital realm, and it's in the physical realm. So they're really just uh, shadows and ghosts. So that was that's what gets us to, you know, 2009, and then for the next decade things just get worse, in in the digital realm. And the reason they get worse is because of the Twitter cane, right? And social media becomes toxic, right? And all these other, the these other counterparties they all get more centralized and they get more uh, dysfunctional. And finally, Bitcoin gets to critical mass, and now you have uh, a viable digital energy network. And so if, if I want to, uh, if I want to create something of substance in the digital realm, the way to do it is to embed the Bitcoin in it. Hmm. And you can do that for everything. For example, on, uh, on YouTube, it, you know, it seems evident, right? Just ask, ask a, uh, a YouTube, uh, host to, you know, post, a thousand dollars if they want to host a thousand people, and ten thousand dollars if they want to host ten thousand people, and a hundred thousand dollars worth of sats. Please, Bitcoin Maximus, don't beat me up for using dollars. I will convert it to sats at some point, but but uh, I'm just using the the current uh, fiat numbers to give a rough order of size. If they did that then every time a scammer tried to take advantage of you, if they did it in a big way with 100,000 fake followers, it would cost them $100,000. And then every, every time you go to the trouble, now, now you're monetizing malice, okay? Mm -hmm. Because if, if there's a 100,000 person scam on YouTube, it's probably worth 10 minutes or five minutes for you to fill out the form to get it shut down, especially if you get paid 10 or 20 or 30% of the fee, right? So uh, right now, if you try to report, I, I had someone imitating me the other day on Twitter. So yeah, it seems like a slam dunk, right? I mean, I, I'm going to go and report it and say, look, this person is imitating me. They've got my bio, my laser eyes, and, and I've got the blue check with the 2.7 million followers. So how long can it take for you to look at my blue check and the 2.7 million followers and the other person with 37 followers that stole my entire bio and then cancel them? So I wait like two days and I get like an email. Uh, sorry, but we're unable to confirm that you're actually in charge of the account. And so your appeal has been denied. And this is after 10 minutes of clicking on things. So at this point, it's it's kind of a joke, right? That, that um, the deck is stacked in favor of the malefactors against the good actors with no consequences for malice, with no reward for virtue. So you build you build the digital energy into all of that, and now you have consequence, and, and consequence leads to truth mm -hmm. because like you can build it into your all your inboxes. If they if they built this uh <clears throat> some kind of either deposit or a gas fee 
you want to send me uh, an email, fine, you know, post 10,000 Satoshis or a thousand Satoshis, post something. And if I delete you, right, then I get to keep it. And if I don't delete you, you get the money back or, or something. Or maybe you should just be paying me for my time. If I'm going to sit, you know, pay me a nickel for clicking, right? Seems like that. I mean, it, the way the postal service worked is they charge for stamps. You can't send a letter to someone for without yeah. a dollar, right? Yeah. So, so implement postage of some sort, and then all the inboxes become virtuous again. Do you know I I have uh, an Instagram inbox I can't look at because it's full of like, you know, robot scammers. I have a Twitter inbox I can't look at. You know, it's full of junk. I have three email filters on my corporate email account scanning continually. <laughs> right. So it's just, it's a never ending thing. There is, and 95% of the comments on Twitter are, uh, are bot comments. So what, what Satoshi's doing is not just revolutionizing banking. When you can move money from one counterparty to another counterparty without an intermediary, you've, you've revolutionized payment remittance. When you can manifest the money in cyberspace, you've revolutionized all store of value. When it becomes scarcity, you've almost obsolesced all the other store of value assets. Like, why would you want anything that wasn't going to last forever with a deflationary supply? There's uh, everything else has a finite, has a half life of 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, and an inflationary supply, right? It's either, it, it's either decaying naturally or it's being inflated naturally. So, why would you want to own any of it as store of value? The answer is you wouldn't. All that stuff should be demonetized and, and it should be ripped down to its utility value, right? So that's the second revolution. But the third revolution is, is bringing, bringing integrity to cyberspace. Truth, consequence, integrity, right? The laws of physics to cyberspace. That, and, and that's the part that is not understood. Once you understand that, you realize, you know, you can't fix... Google and Facebook and Amazon and Apple and Twitter and, and all your email and everything you do online, you can't fix these things without it. Right. Uh, it's, it's not just safety, like it's safety for everyone that uses the platform. So there's clearly there's some cyber civility and cyber security there, but it's also product quality. Like, like how is the product quality degrade when you click on someone's tweet and 95% of the comments or 98% of the comments are garbage bots. I mean, it's like, how would you feel about your luxury hotel if you walked in and there were like 62 wild animals crapping over everything, right? And everything broken and stinks, right? It's like, you can't create anything beauty, uh, anything of beauty, anything elegant. Unless you have um, the laws of physics and and uh, irreversible consequence, and uh, that takes you to the last point, which is if you want to create a city in cyberspace, you need cyber property and cyber matter and cyber energy to create a city in cyberspace. Just like you want to create the city of New York, you needed granite to build on. You need granite, steel, and glass and some technology. You couldn't have built New York on swamp and sand, you know, with balsa wood. Wouldn't work. And uh, so I often I use that metaphor. It's a city in cyberspace because it's got 21 million blocks or less. Because so mm. something you build there right has has the ability to last forever and so what what are you building well you the bitcoin is the is the economic foundation the business is the thing you're building on top of the foundation so i can build 
a mobile app. I can build a website. I can build a foundation. I can, I can build something. But you can look around you. Uh, Cash App is built on part of this foundation. Uh, Moon Wallet is built on this foundation. MicroStrategy has built a business on this foundation. A lot of ways to plug in. You can plug in your balance sheet. You can plug in your product. You can plug in your service, right? You can you can create an insurance comp uh, insurance product. You can create any kind of you know all the hardware devices, right? They can be built, and and uh, the hardware devices become more valuable because of the value of the thing that's in cyberspace. And so, um, ultimately, that's that's why I think this is so revolutionary. It's it's if the last thirty years gave us ten trillion dollars worth of big tech stuff based upon digital music and digital communications and digital photos, right? What's the next thirty years give you based on digital energy and digital matter? Right? There's no there's no reason why. You know, look, Apple could become a bank with ten trillion dollars in the iCloud. They could. Will they? Unclear. Probably not. Everybody gets caught in their paradigm, so they couldn't. But if Apple wanted to, to create, uh, you know, a secure hardware wallet or secure element in the iPhone, you know, and do and do multi-signature management between the iCloud, the iPhone, they're already doing, you know, multi-factor authentication better than anybody else to protect emails and documents and photos and videos and some monetary transactions. So they could, it's natural for them. Facebook could, Google could, Microsoft could, or not. Right. But what I would say to any of them, if I was talking to the CEOs of any of those companies is, is your products are impaired right now because of the lack of digital energy circulating on your network. And, you know, Bitcoin is the, the material that you can use to clean up your cyberspace and clean up your cyber applications. And without it, you can see Twitter's struggle to solve the problem of bots since the beginning the company was formed, right? Right, and, and I just illustrated YouTube hasn't solved the problem. Right. And, and uh, I didn't mention, right. How many scammers come at you through WhatsApp or a messenger or, or just iMessage or any other app. I mean, all the time, anybody that gets, you probably must get hit on all the time if you're a podcaster, right. Uh, all the time, every communication channel is an insecure communication channel. And that's because it's an, we live in a world of asymmetric warfare where, where someone can launch 10,000 attacks out of the blind, right out of the, out of the shadows with impunity. And if every one of them fails, they wasted a little bit of electricity, but if one of them succeeds, they get paid. And, uh, and so we need to shift the balance of power. And the way to do it is you, there have to be consequences, you know, like there, we've seen it in Twitter. If I walked up to you on the street, and you were standing there, maybe next to your family or your friends, and I said some of the things to you that people say to each other on Twitter, mm. you know, I, you would think, first of all, I live in Florida, right? I mean, his, armed society is a polite society. People have guns, right? Like uh, angelic little girls walk around with guns in their purses, and you might think that they're non-threatening, but they could take out a weapon and shoot you dead in a couple of seconds. So you think twice before you say things or do things, right? Road rage will get you killed. Going to a bar and stepping on someone's foot could get you killed, right? Looking at someone's girlfriend the wrong way can get you killed. But, but that's always been the case in the physical realm. There are consequences. You're rude to someone, you get punched, right? You, uh, you break something, you get charged, or you get ejected, or you lose your privileges, in cyberspace, it's just people get very complacent and they think that they could just do anything and say anything they want to anybody. And, you know, like, and, and, oh, well, I get blocked. Maybe I'll create another persona or I'll launch another one or the like. I think, um, 
that's what creates uh, a lack of safety and civility. And if we want to introduce civility into the world again, I mean, the, the obvious example is, you know, you, you have to uh, post some sort of deposit for safe passage through cyberspace, and then you got to pay fees to move from here to there. And, uh, and you should monetize your behavior. There's one more point I'd make. Can you imagine sun shining on your face in cyberspace? What is the equivalent to sun shining on your face in cyberspace? I don't know. When you walk outside your house and you look up and the sun shines on your face, what's happening? Vitamin D, um, different biological Ener reactions. Light is energy, right? Yeah. You're energy in. is striking you. Sun shining on your grass turns it green. Sun shining on the world makes us live, right? Indirectly, sun shining on the earth is what creates the trees, creates the coal, right? Creates the fossil fuels, et cetera. The sun shining on your face is when energy is, is flowing from another party to you. So now coming back to cyberspace, how does sun shine on you? Like uh, when I come listen to your podcast, you stream me Satoshi's. So every minute I listen and I'm engaged, a hundred Satoshis comes my way or a thousand or whatever the number is. Okay. What happens when a million Satoshis a minute comes my way? It's a pretty bright sun, <laughs> right? What about 10 Satoshis? It's a very dim light, right? I, if I crank up the energy, right? I, I can literally uh, turn on the light. Okay. What's gravity? Gravity is when I'm, a, or magnetism. I want to, um, I throw you off a wall and you fall to your death. Okay. That's a gravity. Well, the equivalent of that is, uh, well, Cedric, uh, post um, all the money you have in the world right now, your entire bank account and put it on deposit. And then if you, and now take this test that if you, uh, and if you, click on the wrong button, you fail, I take the money. You're dead. <laughs> or, or at the very least, we could say, like, you're on Twitter and you posted 10 million Satoshis to be on Twitter or 1 million or 100 million or 100,000, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Um, I can give you an, a, a purple check for 100 million Satoshis or I could give you an orange check for 100,000 Satoshis, right? So you're on Twitter and now you have to behave in a certain way. That includes don't get too close to the edge, right? Too close to the edge is when you tell someone you could commit a bodily crime or you threaten their well-being or their family. That's too close to the edge. You fell off the edge. We we eject you and we take your money, right? That's, that's an example of uh, gravity. But another interesting example is I want people with PhDs in astrophysics to listen to me for an hour. And I'm willing to pay a uh, hundred thousand satoshis, or uh, a million satoshis, to each one that meets my criteria. How do you get the million satoshis? You come to my website. You fill out the form. If I accept you, then you're you're uh, allowed in the room. Now you're in the room. Now we do our meeting. I do my podcast. At the end of the podcast, you get the million satoshis. I just created a gravitational attraction, right? Energy was exchanged between us. What is friction? You know, friction is uh, you got to pay a price. Like you want to walk, you know, or you want to walk up a mountain. Okay. It's painful to walk up Mount Everest. So what do I do? I'm like, well, here's, here's the friction. Every single time you go through that one page, or you do that one thing, you have to post another 10,000 Satoshis. You want to do, you know, if you want to post, uh, how about this? I mean, like, it's a simple thing. You want to actually uh, troll 10,000 different accounts on Twitter each day. You have to post 10,000 Satoshis for each one. Now I've created friction. Okay, is friction a good thing or a bad thing? Well, fr friction is a good thing. It creates conservation of energy in the universe, among other things. It's a lot of machines you can't build without friction. Right, uh, you can't walk across the floor without friction. So, if you wanted to implement real-world ideas like resistance, friction, 
gravity, sunlight, right? Peril. If you want to, you know, I stand on a wall up here. You're down there. If you want to hurt me, you have to crawl up the wall. Like think about every wall built in Europe for the past 2000 years, right? I build a 50 foot wall. You're an attacker. You're at the bottom of the gravity well. I'm at the top of the gravity well. I'm going to drop rocks on your head. Okay. What's the price you have to pay to get to me? You have to actually put enough energy in to get to the top of the wall, right? So when would I do that? Well, if I have something precious, like maybe I want to have an intimate conversation about something and I don't want 18,000 people on the spaces, including mortal enemies. I just want people that are really serious. So I, I crank up the deposit and now there's an energy price you have to pay. By the way, you're touring, uh, you're touring in the South of France. You crawl up the hill to see uh, the Citadel. When you walk down the hill, you get your energy back. See, like, <laughs> You pay a price to get up there mm -hmm. and then you get your energy back coming down. Right. It's, it's not that different in cyberspace. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I think that everything needs to be reconsidered, right? You need to rethink banking, rethink money and rethink uh, all digital applications in a world where digital energy exists. Yeah. Powerful stuff. This has been a tremendous chat, Michael. I've enjoyed it fantastically. Um, there's so much more to cover. I, I'm only going to ask you one more question this today, but we, we didn't get into how FASB settles on fair value accounting for measuring crypto assets. I think that's a huge development. MicroStrategy yeah. is coming out with their earnings next week or at the beginning of November. I'll read to you your pinned tweet. Bitcoin is a swarm of cyber hornets serving the goddess of wisdom, feeding on the fire of truth exponentially growing even sm ever smarter, faster, and stronger behind a wall of encrypted energy. So my final question to you is, how is Bitcoin like a union? Yeah, the, 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 the point of the quote is, you can't kill it by killing any one individual part of it. It is a swarm creature. And um, it's a swarm creature. At, Every every corporation, every person, every entity, every regulator, every Bitcoin machine, every everything plugged in the network is part of the Bitcoin system. And it gets more powerful as more energy, as more as more creatures or, or more entities join, right? I mean, if someone joins with a million Satoshis, they bring energy to it. When uh when Cash App plugged lightning into their application for 40 million people that brought a lot of energy. If you buy a billion dollars worth of it, that buy, brings a lot of energy to it, right? Every, every organization or regulator that embraces it to any extent brings energy to it. And as, as more and more entities join, right? It's like a union because they're only joining because they have the shared ideology, right? They have the same values, right? What are the values, right? Serve, you know, worship the goddess of wisdom, right? Uh, truth, math, conservation of energy, nature, right? The natural order of things. If it bothers you that one person could destroy every hotel room in the world in one split second with no consequences, if that bothers you, then probably you want Bitcoin, right? Because that's non-conservative, right? If you believe in order, Right. If you if you believe in fairness and truth and equity and rationale, then uh, then that is wisdom. Then you want to join a union of you want to join a, a group of people that share your values and share your beliefs. The reason it's like a union, though, is is that um, when you join the union, instead of a union card and membership, you get Bitcoin, and. <laughs> And, and Bitcoin is your union card and, and Bitcoin is naturally empowering. And if you choose uh, to plug yourself into it and, and you can plug one-tenth of yourself into it, 
right? You could plug one tenth of your tangible assets into it or one one hundredth of your tangible assets into it. So you get to join the union 1%. Or you could plug your entire family into it. You can join the union 100%. You can join the union 200%. I think I calculated MicroStrategy joined the union 250%. We actually invested 250% of our of our uh, equity into into Bitcoin. So you can join, but you can also um, you can align uh, your company as well, right? I mean, Grayscale's got an alignment, MicroStrategy's got an alignment, every Bitcoin miner's got an alignment, Block has got an alignment, Fidelity's got an alignment, Nidig's got an alignment. You you run a company. You're a podcaster. You have an you have aligned your P and L as well as your balance sheet, right? So you get to align uh, your commercial activities as well as your personal savings activities, and then you can also align your ideologies, right? Your church, your political party, your club, right? There are there are all sorts of ideologies and philosophies. You know, school of thought. So the network keeps getting more powerful as more people join on, on the margin. If, um, if all 8 billion people on the planet joined, we'd be better. But if all 8 billion people on the planet joined with 1% of their wealth, that's not as good as if they join with 20% of their wealth. But if, um, if all 80 million companies in the world plug their balance sheets in, that's even better. And if they plug their P&L in, that's even better. So, so there are various degrees of unionization. But one thing we see through history is, right, if, if you're, um, if you're uh, weak or the oppressed, then your best hope is to unionize with uh, with everybody else in your circumstance, you all come together and collectively bargain or collectively negotiate in order to generate power against against the party that is oppressing you, and that's what unions have traditionally done, right? They've they've given economic opportunity to the disenfranchised, and that's a justification for the country supporting them and allowing them. Hmm. Um, Bitcoin is a monetary union. Right. And, and uh, everybody's oppressed to some degree by the monetary system in some places, like in the in the developing world. Much worse than in the than in the second world, but even that's much worse than in, than in the developed world. And then, of course, everybody is uh, everybody is disadvantaged in the economy because they have to actually build their products and their and their services around a currency which is dysfunctional and or corrupt so bitcoin it offers that it's it's better than a union but it's at least a union for someone that understands union i would use that metaphor but uh, but the but the tweet it's much broader than that right the, what the tweet is saying is that Bitcoin will never die as long as there's one person alive in this world that yearns for freedom. That's what that tweet says. Hmm. Whether it's a Bitcoin miner or a person with a Bitcoin wallet or somebody running a node or a company, it doesn't matter who it is. As long as there's at least one person in the world that understands Bitcoin and yearns for freedom, Right, it will continue. It's a, it is a, uh, a decentralized ideology, and you can't kill an idea. Like, well, you can't kill an idea until nobody is left on Earth that believes in the idea, right? And the idea is freedom and sovereignty. That's the idea manifested in a technology protocol, and that's what you want to be, right? There are other ideas. I think we like this one. We th I think we think that the, uh, you know, goddess of wisdom would like this one. <laughs> we definitely like this one. And what you know, and I, I want to encourage people not to be scared. I think 
Michael Saylor and Michael Strategy have been proving or demonstrating not being scared by building the bridge of steel made out of Bitcoin and standing on that bridge. You guys bought hundreds of millions to start and you keep buying more to prove that the bridge is safe, that the technology is safe and to lead the way and, and, and by example. And I also think back to your tweet. I love 90s hip hop. And you said more money, more people, more power. And it was a really interesting way to define the Bitcoin union and what we're doing here. Um, this chat has been so dope, Michael. I leave it to you for any parting words and to let people know where they can find you, your work and MicroStrategy and what MicroStrategy is up to. Yeah, well, I appreciate you inviting me on. I, I love what you're doing. And, uh, and, and uh, I think that's what makes Bitcoin special. It's that uh, we're all working together in order to educate the public that there's a better way. And uh, I would encourage you to keep educating and uh, I will do the same. Uh, all my thoughts and education, they're, they're either on Twitter, go to Sailor, S-A-Y-L-O-R, uh, on Twitter, that's my handle. Or I try to post everything that I think is constructive on hope.com. Bitcoin is hope, H-O-P-E. And uh, I mean, those are the two primary resources that uh, I point people toward. And uh, I would just say, let's keep up the good work and spread the good word. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been fantastic. Yeah, my pleasure. This episode with Michael Saylor on how Bitcoin is a shining city in cyberspace waiting for you is powered by CrowdHealth. As always, stack sats, stay humble and stay laser focused out there. And thank you for listening. This is Cedric. Peace.